Hi, my name is Evan Atherton. I'm a Senior Principal Research Scientist with Autodesk Research. And in this tutorial series, I'm going to show you how to build an end-to-end -end deep learning pipeline with Bifrost in Autodesk Maya. The example we're going to look at is creating a neural inverse kinematic solver for a mechanical rig like this one here. Even though this example is specific to rigging, my main goal is to build an intuition for identifying practical problems suitable for deep learning. Then we'll walk through how to actually build a deep learning pipeline to solve that problem using the new machine learning compounds in Bifrost. We've also included two sample graphs in the Bifrost browser that are essentially the finished state of this tutorial, so feel free to dig around in those if you'd like. I'm basically going to be showing you how to build those from scratch, really to share more of the intuition behind some of the concepts. So hopefully by the end of the series, you'll feel equipped to start using these new machine learning compounds to solve uh, specific problems in your own workflows, and you might even pick up a few general Bifrost tricks along the way. The series is broken into four parts. This first part will be a brief introduction to just a few deep learning concepts that'll be relevant for the tutorial. I'll also give an introduction to the specific problem of inverse kinematics we're gonna look at for the rest of the tutorial. In part two, we'll build a procedural data generator in Bifrost to generate training data. In part three, we'll train our model in PyTorch and then run the model back in Maya with Bifrost. And in part four, we'll cover some strategies for improving the model after we've set up our pipeline and done our first pass. So to start, I want to talk uh, briefly about why deep learning is even useful in media and entertainment workflows. You might have heard someone refer to neural networks as universal function approximators. So functions generally take some input or group of inputs X, then they map that to an output or group of outputs Y. And they do that with some equation that someone's figured out represented by this arrow here. Well, neural networks do the exact same thing, except instead of a bunch of math or rules that someone had to figure out, they're able to take a bunch of examples of inputs and outputs and learn the mapping between them. So that if you give the train neural network a new input, it's able to approximate an output based on the patterns it's learned from the data. Turns out that a lot of things in content creation workflows are functions. So even if you as a user only have to hit a button in Maya, at the end of the day, there's some math or algorithm in the background taking its input from the scene and returning its output back to the scene. So this list is obviously not exhaustive, but just to give you an idea of some of the functions you, you know, might be using in your workflows and what parts of the workflows they might pop up in. But if we already have a bunch of functions that do stuff we need, then why do we need deep learning? In my opinion, deep learning really excels in two places in content creation workflows. One is if you do, in fact, have a function that does something you want, but maybe it's really computationally expensive. So as you probably know in content creation workflows, it's really important for the artist to be able to see the results of their work at interactive or near interactive rates when possible. So if you have a process that's computationally expensive and slows down their playback frame rate, it introduces a lot of friction into their workflow. But in some of those cases, you can actually learn an approximation of that function with a neural network that gets you pretty close to the real function, but can be orders of magnitude quicker to compute. So a really good example of this is the ML deformer that was just released in Maya 2025, which takes an entire stack of deformers on a character mesh, which can really slow down the scene, and it replaces the computationally expensive deformation calculations with a neural network that's able to approximate these solvers. But the neural network is able to compute in a fraction of the time, so instead of the deformation solver is causing the scene to run at 17 frames per second. In this example, the ML deformer computes fast enough for the scene to run closer to 60 frames per second. And the second place I think deep learning really excels in content creation workflows is when we don't actually have the function. Maybe it's time consuming to derive, or maybe it takes special domain knowledge you might not have. But if we have a way to generate paired data of inputs and outputs that doesn't actually rely on knowing the real function, we can use deep learning to learn an entirely new function. So I won't elaborate too much further on this one just yet, as the hands-on example we'll be using for this tutorial falls squarely into that category. But before I jump into that example, I wanna give just a brief intro to deep learning. There's a lot of nomenclature in deep learning. A lot of it is used interchangeably, sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly. There's 
AI, machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, deep neural networks, transformers, etc. So for the rest of this tutorial series, we're going to be talking about just one single type of network, and that's this. You've probably seen a diagram very similar to this at some point. This is a multi-layer perceptron. It's a fully connected feed forward network with an input layer, some hidden layers, and an output layer. And these are really the bedrock, kind of the, the bread and butter of modern machine learning, and they're super capable of all sorts of tasks. So when I was putting this together, I debated how much of the math I should show to explain uh, what this type of neural network does. And completely separately, I saw this quote from uh, the creator of Keras, which is one of the most popular Python libraries for machine learning. Uh, math and deep learning papers is usually worthless and was placed there purely as a signal of seriousness. I tend to agree with this, <laughs> so it inspired me to try and do this intro with as few equations as possible. So I'm going to try to do this with a single equation, which uh, still might look intimidating, but I'll break it down. And then afterwards, you can honestly just completely forget about this if you want. This is an equation that represents the math that's happening in each layer of that neural network. So the goal is to compute this equation at each layer until we reach the final layer. Then this equation represents the actual output of the neural network, which is what we're really after. So to find the output of any given layer, we first do a weighted sum of the previous layer's output. We add what's called a bias term, and then we apply an activation function to all that. So there are a lot of different activation functions, but they're all really simple math, and their purpose is to add nonlinearity into the network so that they can learn more complex patterns. So at the end of the day, for each layer, we have one matrix multiplication, one element-wise addition, and one element-wise transformation. Uh, perhaps the most important part here is that what the network actually learns during the training process are the weight matrices and the bias vectors for each layer. Then once we have those, we can pass in some new input, use those learned values to compute the output of each layer with the equation we just walked through until we get the final output we're looking for. That's about all I'm going to cover today on the theory. So next I'm going to set up the example we'll be using for the rest of the series, which is to create an inverse kinematic solver using a neural network. The pipeline we're going to build will consist of three parts procedural data generation in Maya using Bifrost, model training in PyTorch, and then model deployment and iteration back in Maya with Bifrost. And again, I don't want this to be too focused on rigging, but I chose to use inverse kinematics as our example because it's actually a relevant problem for artists and technical directors, and it happens to be relatively straightforward from a deep learning perspective. So I thought it had a nice balance of being approachable while still being useful. If you're not super familiar with rigging, in a nutshell, it's the process of taking a character's mesh or group of meshes, adding an internal skeleton, which, as you'd imagine, is a series of virtual joints and bones, and then adding constraints to that skeleton that describe the behavior of the rig uh, given certain artist inputs. So these constraints can be things like kinematic solvers that define how a skeleton moves, or things like deformation solvers, which define how a mesh deforms given, given the movement of the skeleton. When we talk about kinematics, we're referring to either forward or inverse kinematics. Forward kinematics is where the artist sets the rotation of a joint explicitly, and all the joints in the skeletal hierarchy below that are similarly transformed. And inverse kinematics is when you have a target that you want the end of your kinematic chain to reach, and you mathematically compute all the necessary, uh, necessary joint rotations you need to reach the target. The forward kinematics is super easy to set up, but it's the inverse kinematics that often gives the artist the type of control they need to naturally pose uh, the characters for animation. But while animation packages like Maya have out-of-the-box IK solvers that you can apply to skeletons, it uh, usually takes a skilled artist to string together the right solvers in the right way to get the rig to behave properly. And depending on the type of rig, that can take them days to do in some cases. So for the rest of this example, we're going to be looking at this three-axis mechanical rig here. And our goal is to have an IK solver that will take a target position in 3D space and give us the three angles we need for the end of the rig to reach that target. If you'll recall the two categories of problems, I think Deep Learning excels at. This is going to fall again into that second category. We don't have the function that will do this for us. We could again string together some solvers 
we do have or write a new solver analytically specifically for this rig. Uh, but again, that can be time consuming, could require a lot of specialized domain knowledge, maybe we don't have. So what we're going to do instead is exploit the fact that it's orders of magnitude easier to set this up as a forward kinematic system. Then we can use that forward kinematic system to generate as many paired training samples as we want by setting each angle to a random value and then measuring where the end of the rig ends up. This becomes a paired sample that we can use for training our network. And because forward kinematics is computationally trivial to compute, we can generate thousands or even millions of training samples procedurally, effectively instantly. And then once our model is trained, we can take a new target position from the scene set by an artist, run that through our network, and then set the predicted joint values back on our rig. And that's it for the introduction. Next in part two, we're gonna get started by setting up our Ford kinematic data generator in Maya with Bifrost.